Hi, this is Chris with Apex AI. In this class, students will learn about object detection in AutoWare Auto. In particular, students will learn about the purpose of object detection and how it fits in with the whole of, of, of the autonomous driving stack. In addition, students will learn about how it works in AutoWare Auto and how to use it. In this first section, students will learn about the purpose of object detection and how the object detection stack fits into the larger autonomous driving stack. Before starting any large or complex software component, two things that should first be understood before doing anything should be what you're doing and why you're doing it. In particular for the object detection stack in an autonomous driving uh, stack, you first need to understand the following. Why are you doing object detection? What is object detection? And what is object detection supposed to do? By answering these questions, we can help define a use case. This use case can then inform architectural and design decisions for our object detection stack and the larger autonomous driving stack. So let's first take a look at a prototypical use case for autonomous driving. In general, an autonomous vehicle should drive towards some goal, and while doing so, it should drive safely. This means that it shouldn't hit things, and it shouldn't behave in a way that's dangerous for other traffic participants. That means it shouldn't uh, stray from lane boundaries, and it shouldn't cut off aggressive, aggressively cut off other traffic participants. Now, how does this relate to object detection? Well, the first use case of not hitting things is very much in the purview of object detection. You need to know where things are in order to not hit them. The second aspect is also related to object detection. In order to not cut off somebody, you need to know how somebody's moving. In order to know how somebody's moving, you need to be able to detect an object over time. This is also under the purview of object detection, albeit in a processed manner. So in short, Object detection is needed for the core fundamental use case of an autonomous vehicle so that you know where things are so you don't hit them. Next, in order to understand the use case in a little bit more detail, in particular the sort of output use case of the object detection stack, we need to look at the whole architecture in which the object detection stack lives within. The architectural model that you see above um, is very prototypical for autonomous systems. Uh, it's applicable for things such as a UAV um, to industrial robotic arms. In general, the way that this kind of model of the autonomous system architecture is, um, it works in the way that basically you have physical sensors, which then uh, talk to produce measurements that are machine understandable. These measurements are then used uh, and passed through under, uh, various algorithms for understanding in order to produce a world model. Um, this world model is then planned uh, within um, to make progress towards some goal. And finally, this results in some kind of control commands, which are then used for um, by the physical system um, to steer the whole system towards its goal in some way. In a little bit more detail, um, here is a very generic and simplified view of an autonomous driving stack. Here it's very similar to the previous stack, except we have a little bit more detail. The sensing aspect is expanded into sensor drivers and some pre common pre-processing. Next, the understanding portion of the stack is broken up into two pillars. One is object detection, which we care about, which then talks to tracking. And in parallel, there's also localization, which then talks to ego motion estimation. The output of these two pillars, that is, tracked objects and a ego motion estimate, is then passed to planning and then control. The key takeaway from looking at the uh, architecture from this view is that planning is the main recipient of object detection vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, tracking. Next. Let's take a look at a couple of the at the problem of object detection from the input perspective. In general, we require um, objects to be detected in three-dimensional space. The reason why we do this is because planning happens more or less in three-dimensional space as well. 
As a result, we require that the measurements, that is the inputs to the object detection stack, must be in three-dimensional space as well. There are many ways to produce measurements that are in three-dimensional space, ranging from ra radars, uh, stereo cameras, um, and LIDARs, and some esoteric combinations of uh, those different sensors. But for the purpose of this class, we'll mostly focus on uh, LIDAR. So what did we just learn? Well, we learned that object detection is fundamental to the uh, autonomous driving use case and is needed in order to fulfill it. We've also learned that there's multiple ways to fulfill the input requirements for an object detection stack, but we're mostly focusing on LiDAR. Lastly, we also learned that the output of object detection is used in many places in the autonomous driving stack, ranging from planning, tracking, and classification. In the next section, we'll take a look at how the object detection stack is architected in AutoWare Auto and some of the motivation behind that architecture. In this section, students will learn about the architecture of the object detection stack in AutoWare Auto. Students will also learn about the motivation behind the architecture of AutoWare Auto's object detection stack. Recently, most Artificial intelligence problems have two general categories of solutions, uh, one of which being deep learning and the other being classical approaches. Um, most work in these sort of artificial intelligence problems recently has been in the deep learning realm. And that's not surprising because it's a very cool and interesting way to do things. And it also generally provides you with cutting edge performance. It's there are some downsides to deep learning, though, of course. It's not very controversial to say that deep learning approaches require a significant amount of data, be it labeled or otherwise. It's also generally not controversial to say that um, a typical network with no kind of special um, considerations requires a GPU to have any sort of reasonable runtime characteristics. By contrast, classical approaches are sort of not quite so interesting and not quite so cutting edge because uh, it's mostly been co-opted for deep learning approaches. The flip side though is that classical approaches are generally very easy to understand. Um, and on the more simple side. And where classical approaches typically don't require data, at least not to the same degree as deep learning approaches, you kind of trade that off for having tuning parameters that you need to fiddle with. Deep learning based approaches also have additional downsides. There is, for example, the problem that the theory behind deep learning is not very well understood. And so any kind of interpretation of your deep networks is generally very challenging. On top of this, deep learning, learning typically requires um, a dependence on large and complex frameworks such as TensorFlow or PyTorch. You can, of course, roll your own version of a deep network, but it, that's sort of not recommended. The last main issue with deep networks is that they're also very much vulnerable to adversarial attacks in general. Um, in particular, there's been some recent work on adversarial attacks on LiDAR-based um, object detection networks. So the main uh, takeaway then is that AutoWare Auto uses a classical object detection stack. Uh, now the question then becomes, why do we do that? The simplest and most direct answer is that um, a classical stack, stack is simpler. It's therefore easier to understand. Um, and this kind of translates into being easier to implement and easier to then to kind of control the implementation. A corollary to this is that it has fewer or no dependencies. Um, and it's more robust to adversarial attacks because it's kind of well understood. A hard, kind of hardware corollary to this is that it also has lower computational overhead because it's simpler. And this means that it doesn't require accelerated compute hardware in order to work. This makes it more broadly applicable. A classical object detection stack permit, provides a solid foundation, mm -hmm. which then permits more exotic solutions to be built on top of that. 
Next, let's take a look at what a, the classical object detection stack looks like in Auto or Auto, in, per, in particular, what kind of nodes are broken down within. So the classical object detection stack here basically has a one directional data flow, wherein you have raw data and then you just continually process it until you have objects detected. The object detection stack encompasses portions of the sensing and understanding aspects of an autonomous system. The sensing aspect is pretty straightforward. You have your physical LiDAR sensors. These then are translated into something machine understandable by the drivers. You then do some common pre-processing via static transforms and some filtering, uh, and then fusing into a common representation. This representation is then used in multiple places, but for the purposes of the object detection stack, it's used in uh, the following flow of ground filtering, object detection, and then finally shape extraction. So what did we just learn? Well, first is that artificial intelligence problems typically have two solutions nowadays, one being deep learning based approaches and another being classical approaches. The object detection stack in AutoWare Auto uses a classical approach because it's simpler, faster, and has fewer dependencies. The classical object detection stack in AutoWare Auto encompasses both the sensing and understanding portions of, the auton of an autonomous system. The sensing aspect consists of sensor drivers and some common pre-processing, whereas the understanding portion consists of ground filtering, clustering or segmentation, and shape extraction. In the next section, we'll start going down the object detection stack in AutoWare Auto, uh, first talking about pre-processing. In this section, students will learn about LiDAR preprocessing. In particular, students will learn about the purpose behind LiDAR preprocessing and some basic operations therein. So where are we in the stack right now? Well, for preprocessing, we're in the sensing aspect of the LiDAR processing pipeline. Here we're talking about the transform and filter nodes and the fusion nodes, um, which is a common aspect to multiple kinds of algorithms. Now, let's kind of understand what the problem of LiDAR preprocessing is and what it's trying to solve. In general, from a downstream perspective, we want to take in the minimum amount of information which will allow us to produce the correct results. Uh, any more than that, and we're just kind of using more CPU cycles uh, and potentially adding noise which can affect our result in a negative way. Uh, if you're familiar with statistics, this is the notion of a sufficient statistic. Uh, there are some different operations we can use in order to reduce this complexity and get closer to our sufficient statistic. We can do things like remove useless data, which won't affect our result and just add CPU cycles. We can also remove problematic or bad data, which could negatively affect our, affect our result. And we can also remove redundant data, which can also affect uh, our result by adding additional cycles. Finally, we also want to produce a single consistent output, which allows us to more easily use um, the inputs for downstream algorithms. Let's now take a look at a couple of different common operations, uh, common pre-processing operations on LiDAR data. The first of which is range-based filtering. Uh, Range-based filtering can be thought of as an example of removing useless or bad data. As an example, points that are very far away from the sensor um, are useless because they don't really have any context, so they're just kind of noise. By contrast, points that are very close to the sensor uh, can fall into the ego vehicle and uh, negatively affect our result by providing false positive detections. Another example of removing bad data is angle-based filtering. There are regions in the LiDAR's field of view which maybe don't work so well for various reasons. Uh, one example of this is, for example, if you have multiple LiDARs, then the lasers from one LiDAR can cause false positive detections in another LiDAR. This is known as the flying birds effect. This effect can be mitigated, though, by using angle-based filtering. Another operation that uh, can be done is removing redundant data. Uh, a common way to work around this is by using downsampling techniques. The idea here is then that you can reasonably represent an object with fewer points rather than more points. For example, you can re represent a wall by a handful of points 
falling onto a plane instead of like thousands of points. There are many approaches to do this, but the most common approach is voxel grid-based approaches. Uh, for this technique, you essentially subdivide the space into a series of boxes or cuboids, and every point that falls into a particular box is represented then by a single point, either as the centroid of the box itself in the approximate case, or the centroid of all points that fall into the box in the centroid case. There are also random sampling-based techniques, but those are generally not recommended because it introduces bias, and uh, it's kind of random. The last thing that needs to be done uh, is fuse multiple point clouds together into a single consistent representation. The purpose of this is to have a single nice and clean representation uh, for all downstream algorithms to use. Now the act of fusing things is actually pretty simple in the context of point clouds. Really all you need to do is find all of the messages which are most aligned temporally, and you can do this using, for example, the message filters package in ROS. Um, once you have these, this set of uh, messages, you then want to do a static transform uh, to put all of the messages in, uh, into a common coordinate frame. Uh, this is basically how it's done in Auto or Auto. Uh, in the more general case, wherein you have uh, the ego vehicle moving and thus the sensors moving, uh, then in this case, the point clouds will be skewing over time as the points come in, uh, the vehicle is moving. So in order for the resulting point clouds to be usable by downstream algorithms, you need to correct for this ego motion. Um, this though is not implemented in auto or auto. So what did we just learn? We learned that preprocessing is an important and necessary part in any LiDAR processing pipeline. It provides a clean, simple representation for downstream algorithms. This is accomplished by a number of different algorithms. For example, you can remove noisy data or data from problematic areas via range or angle-based filters. You can also simplify redundant data by using voxel grids or other downsampling techniques. And finally, you can also create a single consistent representation by using fusion vis-a-vis uh, -vis transforming and concatenating point clouds together. In the next section, we'll talk, start talking about the meat of the object detection pipeline, the understanding portion, and we'll start by talking about ground filtering. In this section, students will learn about the first part of the understanding portion of the object detection stack, ground filtering. In particular, students will learn about what the problem of ground filtering is and why we have it. They'll also learn about different ways to solve the problem of ground filtering and how it's done in auto or auto. Let's localize ourselves in the whole of the object detection stack. Right now we're talking about ground filtering, which is the first part of the understanding portion of the object detection stack. This is the first substantive algorithm in the object detection stack. In general, we should once again motivate the problem of ground filtering. Um, so the question here is, why do we have ground filtering? Why do we even need it in general? So recall that the primary use case for object detection is collision detection. And recall, as we mentioned in the preprocessing section, that we want the minimal amount of information passed um, to downstream algorithms to make lives easier for them. If we add in the idea that you can't hit things that are on the ground because we drive over the ground, then it makes sense to filter out ground points because they're useless for the context of further downstream object detection algorithms. One thing I should also note is that while ground points are useless in the context of object detection, they're still useful in other contexts, for example, occupancy mapping. Let's now take a look at a, have a general overview over some solution techniques for the ground filtering problem. I'll note that this is sort of generally representative but not exhaustive. So one first technique is to do a region growing technique based on curvatures or normals. The idea here then being that a ground point will be more or less pointing up in terms of its normal. Another approach to use is a model based approach wherein you fit 
a model, for example, a planar model to put the scene uh, using, for example, Ransack. Another common approach is to look at the rays or columns in the depth image um, for a point cloud and classify based on those rays. And then there's other approaches on top of that, such as using uh, powerful factor graph methods or voxel-based methods. I'll note that every one of these approaches has their own upsides and downsides. For example, the region growing technique based on normals is generally pretty slow. By contrast, the uh, model-based approach using RANSEC is very fast, but it's typically non-deterministic because RANSEC is random based on the name, random sample-based consensus. On top of this, the planar model, which is typically used in a model-based approach, is not necessarily the best um, for all autonomous driving applications. For example, uh, in urban driving scenarios, there is road drainage, so the road is not perfectly flat. The ray ground filtering based technique is extremely fast, but there are accuracy issues because it only uses a small subset of the data when classifying each point. In general, also, it, this requires having high vertical resolution uh, for your sensor. And then the other approaches on top of that are generally very slow, as in the factor graph technique, or they throw away points, as in the voxel based techniques. The approach used in AutoWare Auto is the ray ground filtering based technique. This is used because it's fast and it's deterministic, and it also doesn't throw away points. Let's now take a look at what ray ground filtering looks like in general. A standard or typical approach for ray ground filtering, um, which is used in papers where the main focus is further down in the object detection pipeline, is as follows. First, you kind of either build a range image, and, or you otherwise bin the points in the point cloud into angle angular slices um, and call those rays. Next, you know where the ground is local to the ego vehicle and the sensor, and then for every ray you scan through each point in increasing order, and then you say if the triplet of points is pretty flat, then it's still ground points, but if there's a big change in angle, then it's non-ground points from here on out. So what does this look like illustrated? On the left-hand side, we have the ego vehicle and the sensor, and we have a local estimate of the ground and we kind of assume that the ground is flat underneath us. We then see that the next point is has a small angle with respect to us so we can call that ground. And then the next point after that we can compare with a triplet underneath the vehicle, the previous point, and we see that this angle is small as well. So we call this one ground as well. The al algorithm kind of continues as normal and then we see that the next point here has a large angle. So then we say every point from here on out is non-ground. So that's the standard simple approach for ground filtering. In the case when the focus is more on ground filtering, such as the paper by Cho and co-authors, or the approach by Tier 4 in Ottawa AI, uh, the general idea is pretty similar, wherein you kind of subdivide the point cloud into rays and then you kind of scan through every ray, but the algorithm for classifying individual points with an array is a little bit more detailed. So here we introduce two new notions. One is that of the global cone, which is a global estimate of the ground, with respect to the local estimate of the ground underneath the sensor. And then there's also the local cone, which is a local estimate of the ground with respect to a point. So in order to understand this, let's take a look at the algorithm illustrated once again. So here, as before, we have the ego vehicle on the left-hand side with the sensor. We also have a local estimate of where the ground is with respect to the sensor and the ego vehicle. So from here, we can draw a global cone, which is a global estimate of the ground. The first point we see falls into the global cone, so we can say that it's a ground point. The next point is local with respect to the previous point, so we compare it against the local cone. Note that the local cone is typically bigger than the global cone to accommodate more local structure. Um, so here, since the current point is in the local cone of the previous point, we say it's ground. And the same argument follows for the next point. For the point after this, though, we see that it's local with respect to the previous point in terms of distance, but it doesn't fall into the previous point's local cone. Therefore, we say that it's non-ground. Here the algorithm kind of continues, and we see that the next point falls into the local cone of the previous point, 
so it takes on the label of the previous point, which is non-ground. One thing to notice about this algorithm as compared to the sort of standard rate ground filtering uh, approach is that we can kind of go from non-ground points back to ground points, as you can kind of see as the algorithm continues. So what's the approach used in AutoWare Auto? The approach used in AutoWare Auto is the same as uh, AutoWare AI's approach, wherein we have the improved ray ground filtering algorithm. However, on top of this, we've implemented three additional improvements in the AutoWare Auto version of ray ground filtering. The first improvement is by thresholding statistics, which we'll talk about next. And the other improvements are using additional domain knowledge and reinterpreting the problem as a factor graph, which again, we will also talk about in a little bit. The first approach is, uh, the first improvement is thresholding statistics. Astute viewers will note that the idea of a cone uh, math in a mathematical sense is unbounded. So as you get farther and farther away from the source of the cone, that is the vehicle, the cone will basically cover more and more area up until infinity. How this impacts the basic algorithm mm -hmm. is that um, points um, that are far away from the vehicle will more likely be considered um, ground points. This means that at a distance, the ray ground filtering res algorithm results in having bad detections at a distance. So the e quick and easy solution to this is that we limit the size of the global cone. This gives us better detection at a distance. One other thing to note is that the local cone is implicitly bounded because locality is uh, only locally defined. The other thing that we've done is we've added domain knowledge, um, which is a nice uh, and generous way of thinking about it. The less generous way of thinking about it is that we've added in heuristics, aka dirty hacks. What we've essentially done here is we've added three additional labels to the process of classifying each point. These labels are provisional ground, retro non-ground, and non-local non-ground. On top of that, we also do something which is a little bit non-standard and pass information back and adjust the labels, pre the labels of previous points based on these, these new labels. Very briefly though, the idea behind each of these new labels is as follows. The retro non-ground point is uh, label is meant to get as many non-ground points on distant objects as possible. This is because we want to have detection as smooth as possible on distant objects. The other two labels, provisional ground and non-local non-ground, are to handle the transition from non-ground points back into ground points in rays a little bit better. The particular use case this was meant to solve was handling low-lying objects in front of buildings, for example, foliage. Having better segment, uh, better filtering or classification of points in front of buildings um, gives us better segmentation of buildings and thus more, much more tractable bounding boxes uh, for the case of planning. So let's now take a look at what each of these um, labels looks like illustrated. The first thing to talk about is the retro non-ground label. The idea here then is that we see that the next point is very vertical with respect to the previous point. As a result, we call this a retro non-ground. The assumption here then becomes that there, the current point is so vertical with respect to the previous point that both points are a part of some vertical structure. So information is passed back to retroactively um, make the previous point non-ground as well. Once again, that the purpose of that was to get as many non-ground points on distant objects as possible. The remaining two labels, again, are for handling the transition from non-ground back to ground. We'll see here in the um, slide that we are currently at a non-ground point and then we jump to a new unclassified point. We see that this new point is near to the ground cone, but global cone, but not exactly there. But on the flip side, it's very near to the last ground point. As a result, we apply a weak label to this called provisional ground. This label will then become either ground or non-ground based on the next point. In this context, we see that the next point is close to the previous point, and it also falls into the global cone and becomes ground. Because the next point is local and a ground point, this point then becomes a ground point. If the next point were local and a non-ground point, then the provisional ground point would become a non-ground point. By contrast, if the next point was non-ground but not local, the 
uh, next point would kind of decay into a ground point. So those are some of the new labels we've added to the process of ground filtering. The next thing that astute viewers will also have noticed is that there's a lot of sending back of information um, with the new labels. This is somewhat contrasted with the standard dynamic programming view wherein you basically so scan through sorted points and classify points based on some maintained statistic or state. What we can then do is we can reinterpret the problem of ray ground filtering as a factor graph wherein every point in the ray has a label and given these labels and some statistic about the points there is some relationship that's more or less likely between these points. Uh, then we want to find the joint set of labels which are most likely. A little bit more mathematically we can say that the state of each point is described by the label distance to the next point and the height with respect to some local ground estimate and then we can assume some, we can model, make some modeling assumptions wherein there's some unary factors, that is a likelihood of individual labels, and some n-ary factors which describe the relationship between points. This approach is typically solved via message passing algorithms and you can find these factors by machine learning techniques. Note that this isn't a, really a new idea, um, that is the idea of reinterpreting a problem as a factor graph. Uh, there is, for example, the more global matching paper which is another example of reimagining a classic algorithm, that is the semi-global matching algorithm for stereo vision, as a factor graph. We didn't really fully realize this idea of reinterpreting the ground filtering algorithm as a factor graph and doing all of this machine learning stuff. Um, we really just kind of stopped at having algorithm uh, additional labels. For now, I'll just leave you guys with the pseudocode for the ray ground filtering algorithm. I won't go over the this uh, pseudocode because um, we've sort of talked about all of it before, and it's basically a direct transcription of the code within uh, AutoWare Auto. So what did we just learn? Well, we learned that ground filtering is an important part of the object detection stack because it simplifies subsequent algorithms in the stack. There are also many approaches to use to solve the problem, and the approach used in AutoWare Auto is the ray ground filtering based approach. The implementation in AutoWare Auto has a number of improvements as well. These improvements include thresholding statistics to improve the accuracy at range, in addition to adding additional domain knowledge and reinterpreting the problem as a factor graph, which improves the accuracy of the approach. In the next section, We'll continue down the object detection stack and talk about clustering or segmentation algorithms, which are the heart of the object detection stack in AutoWare Auto. In this section, students will learn about the clustering and segmentation algorithms at the heart of the object detection stack. Let's once again first localize ourselves in the object detection stack. We're now talking about clustering or segmentation algorithms which are at the heart of the understanding portion of the object detection stack. The first thing we need to answer when tackling any important problem is uh, why and how. So the first question to answer then becomes why not just use the non ground point cloud because it reasonably represents the space of all points that the um, vehicle could possibly hit. The first answer to this is that a non ground point cloud is a very big and cumbersome object to use. It's hard to do any kind of collision checking or transforming because there's so many individual points. The second issue with a non ground point cloud is that it's basically just a big homogeneous structure. There's no notion of individual objects. You need individual objects in order to kind of do higher levels of understanding and planning, for example, tracking of individual objects or intersection based planning. So that kind of motivates the why of having a segmentation or a clustering algorithm uh, in your object detection stack. The next question to answer then becomes is how? Because we're limited to classical approaches and then therefore just kind of geometric approaches, there's not really too many ways to do this. The main approach sort of semantically is that we want to group points together somehow. So that means we're kind of in a, the regime of clustering algorithms. And we want to group points together based on some metric. 
So what are the approaches we can use for this? Generally speaking, there aren't too many approaches to do clustering or segmentation of point clouds. Um, they're all sort of in the same family. One example is a region growing technique based in voxel space. Another approach is a region growing technique based in image space based on the angle metric. Um, the approach which is used in Auto or Auto is Euclidean clustering, which is essentially clustering or region growing in Euclidean space based on the Euclidean distance metric. Here below, you can kind of see the pseudocode for this very classic object detection or segmentation algorithm. I'm not going to go over this in too much detail because we'll be talking about this uh, a bit later. What I will do is kind of give you two informal or, or alternate views for the Euclidean clustering algorithm that I like to use to reason about it. The first view is the graph view. Here you can kind of conceptualize the point cloud as a large graph where each point in the point cloud is a vertex. Two points or vertices are connected with one another if they are near to one another, meaning that they are within a fixed distance of one another. From this view, a object or a, a cluster is a connected subgraph for this graph. Uh, another way I also like to look at it is a sort of more informal pseudocode. So the general idea here is then you have an empty cluster, you um, then add some point to the cluster which has been unexplored, you then can call this point kind of uh, an open point, and then fall, uh, find all of the points which are near to this point and add them to the cluster. Uh, you can then kind of take the query point and put it into the closed set, so to speak. You then repeat the process for every open point, finding all the unexplored near neighbors, um, and add them to the cluster, uh, up until the point where you have no more points to add. Then you can accept or reject the cluster based on some metric um, to determine whether or not a cluster is noise or not. Um, so in some views, it's kind of a Dijkstra's-like algorithm. But in order to un better understand this, let's take a look at this illustrated. So the first step is you have an empty cluster. Next, you add some arbitrary point to the cluster. After that, you use that point as a query point and find all of the unexplored points which are near to that query point and add them to the uh, cluster itself. Then for every newly added point, you find all the near neighbors to there. And then you kind of repeat the process until there's no more points to add. Um, then you kind of accept or reject the cluster based on some metric. Uh, and then after that, you start with a new point. Astute viewers will notice that I've been very careful to say near neighbors and not nearest neighbors. The reasoning behind this is that a, the problem of nearest neighbors is different from the problem of near neighbors. For nearest neighbors, you want to find the point which is absolutely closest to the query point. By contrast, the near neighbor lookup problem is one in which you find all the set of all points which are within a certain distance of the query point. While these problems are similar, they're different enough that they need different data structures to best solve this problem. For the nearest neighbor lookup, the best data structure is a KD tree, which has a log n lookup complexity. By contrast, for a near neighbor lookup problem, the best data structure is an integer lattice. We'll go over the details of an integer lattice in a little bit, but the key takeaway here is that uh, the, complexity, the lookup complexity for an integer lattice is constant order, uh, k, where k is the average number of neighbors. So to better understand how this works, let's kind of look at an illustrated example. First, you subdivide the space into some set of voxels. Note that the optimal size of a voxel kind of depends on your problem characteristics, so what lookup radius you have. Then you find the uh, voxel which corresponds to the query point. And then you find all the voxels which could possibly hold a point near to the query point. You should also note that you also need to consider the best and the worst cases as far as whether or not a voxel could hold a, uh, a near point or not. Then it's pretty straightforward. All you do is you iterate over every near voxel and every point within each near voxel to find the set of near points to the query point. So what was the big point of doing all this, and what's the kind of upshot or takeaway of this? In order to understand that, let's take a look at the average case uh, computational complexity of the Euclidean clustering algorithm. 
So here, first, the first step is that we want to put all of our points into some data structure. So this is order n, where n is the sinus of the point cloud. Then we kind of do some general setup, and then we start iterating over every point. The first thing to do is you add the point to some data structure, um, and then you, for every point sort of in the current cluster, you do the following. First, you look up all of your near neighbors, where, which has a complexity of q of k, where k is the sort of average number of neighbors per point, as before. Then for every near neighbor found, you kind of iterate over them and add it to the uh, cl current cluster. This gives us a total complexity for the innermost loop of n times k plus q of k. And then there's a little bit of extra cleanup after that. The big takeaway and the big sort of victory here is that um, we can characterize the original algorithm as having a lookup complexity of k times log n. This results in a total time complexity of k times n uh, times uh, log n, uh, which is, in other words, linear rhythmic. Um, by contrast, if we were to use an integer lattice with a constant order, so q of k is k, um, lookup complexity, we get a time total time complexity of k times n. Because k is a problem-defined constant, we basically went from log n log n, that is linear rhythmic, to order n, which is linear. Um, this is very nice because n can be very large in the case of point clouds. It can be on the order of thousands to even hundreds of thousands of points. One last thing I should also note is that Apex AI's internal version of Euclidean clustering has two additional improvements which are similarly impactful. So what did we just learn? We learned that object detection, or segmentation algorithms, are a necessary part of the object detection stack in order to discriminate between individual objects. This then is needed to build a higher level understanding of the world. We also learned that most object detection, or clustering algorithms, are based on region growing methods. The version in Auto where Auto uses uh, is Euclidean clustering. The version in Auto where Auto also has some important optimizations, namely it uses the correct data structure for the underlying problem. This means that it goes from a time complexity of n log n in the average case to a time complexity of order n in the average case. Concretely, this means that while the AutoWare AI implementation runs in about 100 milliseconds per frame, the AutoWare Auto implementation can run in about 10 milliseconds per frame. In the next section, students will learn about the last part of object detection, shape extraction. In this section, students will learn about the last part of the object detection stack, shape extraction. In particular, students will learn about why we have shape extraction, what shapes we extract, how we do it, and some improvements made to these algorithms. Let's take one last look at the architecture diagram um, of the object detection stack. So we can see here now that we're on shape extraction, which is the last step in the object detection stack. So now let's quickly go over what we're going to talk about. First, we need to figure out why we need to do object uh, shape extraction at all. Next, we need to understand different ways to do uh, bounding box extraction or shape extraction. And then we'll talk about other shape extraction techniques. So the first question that we need to answer is why do we need to do shape extraction at all? Why can't we just use the uh, point blobs from segmentation directly? So the answer to this is generally that point blobs, uh, that is point clusters, are generally unwieldy to use. So they're hard to kind of transform, they're hard to kind of communicate, and they're also hard to do collision checking against. Um, they're hard both from a practical um, implementation perspective and also from a computational perspective because they're large and unbounded. If you recall in an earlier section, for example, in pre-processing, we were talking about sufficient statistics, uh, wherein we only want the minimal representation that lets us solve the problems that we want to solve. So the same idea follows here. We want a minimal representation so that we can more easily uh, use these objects uh, for what we want to use them for. So that answers the question of why we have shape extraction. The next question we need to answer is what shape are we extracting? In order to answer this question, we then need to look at this from a user perspective. 
Um, the main use case for object detection, of course, is collision checking by way of planning algorithms. So what we, what we can then look at um, is a nice image from a, text, a freely available textbook uh, called Pl Planning Algorithms by Stephen Laval. Um, in this image, we can see that there's a sort of um, spectrum of different object representations from left to right. On the left-hand side, the objects are uh, the representation is easier to compute um, and easier to collision check against. Um, whereas on the right-hand side, the representation better fits the object, but it's harder to compute and harder to do collision checking for. So what then do we um, want for a, a shape to use in the autonomous driving use case? Well, we want something that's easy to collision check, so that's pushing us to the left. And we want something that's easy to compute, so that's again pushing us to the left. But on the flip side, we want something that actually re reasonably represents the object, so that pushes us to the right. So a good compromise for all of, between these two, these three requirements, um, are ori or oriented bounding boxes. Um, the reason being that they're reasonably easy to compute and they're reasonably easy to collision check, uh, and but more importantly, they reasonably represent the object. On top of that, they're also bounded in memory, which makes things generally a little bit easier to manipulate. So given that we want to compute um, oriented bounding boxes, how do we do this? A standard first approach for computing oriented bounding boxes is to use the rotating calipers method. The idea here is then that you have a blob of points. You then compute the convex hull of these points, which can be done in, for example, uh, n log n time using the monotone chain algorithm. Um, and then you find the bounding box, which uh, you iterate over all bounding boxes that are aligned with one of the sides of the convex hole. And one of these are, is guaranteed to be minimum in either perimeter or area. The problem, though, is that this approach has some downsides. So it only considers boundary points, which is not good because this implies that the approach is sensitive to noise. Uh, if a point is missing or not miss or is added to the boundary, then that'll affect the final result. The other big downside is that it's trivially easy to construct examples that won't fit the data well. As a very standard example here, we have an L shape, which is pretty common in live data, wherein you have one beam hitting a distant car. So here you kind of fit a convex hole and it's roughly triangle shaped. And then more often than not, you find that the best fit bounding box under this algorithm uh, aligns with the long side, giving you a bounding box that is skew from what you would expect it to be. So this matters because a poorly fitting bounding box is, is incorrect. Um, it doesn't accurately represent the object that we want to uh, do, for example, collision checking against. And if you recall, um, for most algorithms, if you pass garbage in, uh, then you get garbage out. And this kind of result is somewhat garbage, uh, arguably speaking. So it would then behooves us to spend a little bit more effort figuring out a good representation or a good way to come up with bounding boxes that better fit the data. So the next obvious approach then is to use principal component analysis to compute the major and minor axes of the bounding box um, and then fit a bounding box which matches these major and minor axes and fits the points. This approach has a number of, number of good properties. For example, it's linear in time, uh, and it uses information from the entire object. Another good property is that it's bounded in its suboptimality as far as how good of a fit it is around the points. Unfortunately, this approach still doesn't give us the result that we want. Uh, returning to the example of the L-shaped bounding box, we kind of hit the same uh, downside, where in often cases, the major principal component fits kind of diagonally around, along the box, giving us, again, a skewed bounding box. So a next standard approach to use in most robotics and artificial intelligence problems is to pose the problem as a, an optimization problem. Uh, and this is, holds true for the problem of shape or box extraction as well. The common approach here is then that you want to find a partition of points which best fits an L-shape um, where the L-shaped is modeled as two orthogonal lines. 
Generally speaking, finding a partition that is the optimal partition is a combinatorial problem. However, the approach by Shun et al. Um, simplifies this problem by assuming structure given by a single scanning LIDAR. This means we only have a linear set of partitions to kind of iterate over. The downside of this approach is that this assumes a single scanning LIDAR, so for more, a more general use case wherein we have multiple LIDARs, this doesn't really work so well. Zhang and co-authors relaxes this assumption by using a search-based method. The flip side, though, is that this introduces discretization error for the bounding box. So the approach, then, that's used in Auto Auto is the, the first approach by Shun and, and co-authors, except with a couple of pre-processing steps. So we use some of the lessons of the previous uh, eigenbox algorithm, and we first find the principal component of the point blob. We then order the points along this principal component to make it to pretend as if this point blob came from a single scanning LIDAR. Uh, we can then run the uh, bounding box algorithm as normal. One last thing I should note before we move on is that all of these bounding box algorithms I've mentioned are all uh, implemented in auto or auto. So you can play around with them and see the live results yourselves as well. One last thing I want to also mention is some other representations you can use for shape extraction. One standard approach is the convex hole method, um, but as we've discussed before, it's only loosely bounded in memory. In fact, it's upper bounded by the number of points in the point cloud. Um, so this is not ideal for the case of kind of shuffling data around. Um, this you can, however, play around with in AutoWar Auto as well, because we have implemented the monotone chain algorithm. Another approach that can be used are ellipsoids. This is very much similar to using oriented bounding boxes, um, but the flip side then is that you need to solve an optimization problem in order to do collision checking. Uh, one small kind of upside to this is that uh, ellipsoids fit a little bit more easily into an optimization framework uh, as compared to bounding boxes, so you don't have to do some more esoteric things like uh, look at second order cones. Finally, there's also the approach of using super quadratics, which is even more esoteric. Here you can kind of represent very strange and interesting shapes, um, but the major downside here is that finding these super, super quadratics, which represent a scene, require, requires solving a very involved optimization problem. The last thing I want to mention is that there are also some open problems in the space of shape extraction namely handling large concave objects such as the inside of a garage and not pretending it's a big object that you're kind of embedded into. So what did we just learn? We learned that shape extraction is an important and necessary part of the object detection stack. It's needed to simplify the output for other algorithms to use. There are many approaches to do shape extraction, but AutoWare Auto uses a optimal bounding box approach. On top of this, there are still some open problems in the domain of shape extraction. In the next section, we'll take a step back and see how object detection is used in the wider autonomous driving stack. In this section, students will learn about various use cases of object detection. Now let's understand some of the use cases for detected objects. In general, there's four main use cases. Pre-processing, either for classification or further feature extraction, as an input to tracking, or collision detection. In general, object detection kind of only really tells you where things are, but not what they are. Knowing what something is, is useful for various reasons. It can tell you, for example, how something is supposed to move. For example, a cyclist will move differently from a truck. And it can also inform special forms of planning. For example, you need to give a pedestrian extra space compared to a normal vehicle. There's a couple of ways to do classification with object detection. One is that you can directly do detect, uh, classification on detected objects. Another way is to combine object detection with a different classification modality, such as a camera-based classifier. This is an example of late fusion.
More generally, you can use objects as a form of regions of interest. These regions of interest can then be used for further processing, for example, marker detection, signage understanding, or localization vis-a-vis -vis localization man landmarks. One of the main use cases for object detection, however, is as the main input to tracking. The problem of tracking can be thought of as temporarily fusing um, instantaneous observations over time. There's a lot of different ways to do this, and there's a huge wealth of literature on this, but very briefly, there's tracking by assignment methods, which, which separates the problem of data association with the problem of state estimation. And there's also combined tracking methods, wherein everything is one giant uh, probabilistic uh, inference problem. But above all else, the main use case for object detection is collision detection. There's a couple of algorithms you can use to detect whether two polygons or oriented bounding boxes will collide, and these include the separating axis theorem and the gilbert johnson keithy algorithm. There's also many ways to efficiently use um, collision detection, and there's a wealth of literature in the motion planning space about this. One other thing I should note is that you can also use tracked objects uh, in the context of collision detection. So what did we just learn? Well, we learned that there's four main use cases for object detection. First, as a general pre-processing tool, or to determine regions of interest for further uh, algorithm work. Another use case is for classification, either by directly classifying detected objects, or as a part of late fusion. Another key use of objects is as the primary input for tracking, and the fundamental use case for object detection is collision detection by way of uh, planning. As a brief summary to wrap up the theory aspect of this class, um, we learned the following. One is that object detection is an important part of the autonomous driving use case. Um, namely, it lets you satisfy the fundamental use case. It encompasses both the sensing and understanding parts of the an autonomous stack, and its outputs are used in many places, as you can see in the diagram. In particular, the object detection stack in AutoWare Auto is very classical, as you can kind of see, and we've implemented many improvements across the stack, including ground filtering, clustering, and shape, ex shape extraction. In the next section, my colleague Galtham will show you how to use the object detection stack in AutoWare Auto with the LGS VL simulator. Hello all, my name is Gautam and I work with Chris in the Apex Autonomy team at Apex AI. Um, this part of the video, I'm going to be showing you a demonstration of how the perception stack in Autoware Auto works. So basically showing demonstrations of all the theoretical stuff that Chris just talked about. Uh, so for the purposes of this demonstration, we are going to be using a simulator from LG called LG SVL. Um, so that supplies us with all the raw sensor information and then our perception stack processes them and converts them into useful stuff. Uh, so the instructions on how to set up the simulator uh, with to work with AutoWare Auto, we are going to look at that in the official AutoWare Auto documentation. So I'm just going to do a Google search for AutoWare Auto and then from there go into the official documentation page and here on the left you see your tutorials section so you go into the tutorial section and there's lgsvl so make sure you have the necessary requirements to run the simulator and as we have may have mentioned already uh, everything with respect to AutoWare Auto is controlled by ADE. So for running the simulator, there is a special ADE RC file that you need to source. So uh, in your computer, go to the folder where you have AutoWare Auto checked out already. Uh, so as you can see, I have a version of AutoWare Auto in my computer. So I'm gonna source the ADE RC file that is specific for the simulator. And then you can do the usual ADE start and enter, if, or if you want to update, you can update. I just updated, so I don't have to do it right now. Uh, so as you can see, it's mounting some additional stuff like the simulator itself, which usually doesn't get mounted by default. Um, so once we are in, we can now run the simulator. So the command to run the simulator is right here. So run that. 
and that brings up this simulator window. Um, so as you can see here, once the simulator opens, there is this open browser button. So all the configuration for the simulator is done through a web port. Uh, but unfortunately, this open browser button doesn't work. As the instruction says, just go to this particular web address in a browser and you can configure the simulator from there. Um, so once you go into this web address, um, you're not going to see this page right away if this is your first time it's going to ask you for a login so you just sign up there with your email address and password nothing too fancy and it should take you right in and you may not have a lot of maps like i do um, there are instructions in the same document on how to load new maps and how to load new vehicles and all that so the two main things you need to do is have at least one valid map and one valid vehicle uh, so you can you know kick add new here and add a new map and add a new vehicle and simulation is where you create a new simulation environment so you would click this add new button and add the needed map and vehicle and other configuration so i have already created one for this demo i'm going to show you how that looks so the main information that you need to supply to create the simulation is a name for the simulation and then under maps and vehicles is where you will select your desired map and the desired vehicle and this is the other crucial part so the simulator sends all the sensor data through a port this 9090 port and internal to the simulator there is a bridge that converts the messages from this port into valid ROS2 messages so that the rest of the pipeline can use it so make sure this is set to this and all the instructions for this is in the document so make sure you just follow the document and then you can you know enable or disable traffic and set different weather conditions so there is a video later on in the series that talks um, in depth about the simulator and how it works and all that so i'm going to spare you all the details here um so once you create the simulation you can click submit and then you just select the simulator that you created and it will show a tick mark right next to its name and usually at the bottom a play or stop button will show up um, i have some weird rendering issue here but yeah so you basically need to click this play button and that brings up the simulation environment so this is the simulator and at the bottom left you click this joystick icon and that brings up all the different shortcuts within the simulator um, the main thing you need to know is you need to use the arrows to like steer accelerate turn and all that so this is the simulator you can move around to see the scene um, so i'm just going to drive forward a bit so that you can see more of the scene and now at this point we are going to see what messages does the simulator publish so uh, everything we need to do within an ade so i'm going to go to a new terminal and do ade enter and then basically if i do a ROS topic list so these are the same stuff that we went over in the tooling video um, you can see all the different topics that the simulator is currently publishing as you can see all of it is like raw sensor data and they are all namespaced by the sensor so like there is a front lighter there's a rear lighter there's gps imu all that um, so you can you know do different draws to tools and look at the rate at which the messages are coming in or even look at the message contents and all that so now we have all the raw data now we need to process it using our perception pipeline so we have a slide here that shows you the main two commands to run so the command to run the perception pipeline is first you need to source the autoware auto workspace so i'm going to do that here and then the, we created a launch file to launch all the perception stuff so that you guys can look at it uh, so just run the launch command and this is going to run all the different perception nodes that Chris talked about and bring up an Arvis window. So in Arvis, you can see this is the ego vehicle. And if you zoom in, you can see the different frames and everything in the ego vehicle. And we have boxes around all the objects in the scene and we have the lighter data. So here you can visualize different stuff and see what's going on really. So Arvis is just a 3D visualizer that is used in ROS uh, applications. So as you can see, we are now looking at the points from the front lighter. Uh, so you can like look at different stuff here. As Chris talked about, we have a module called ray ground filter that uh, separates points into ground and non-ground. So let's say we wanna look at all the non-ground points. So you would just give the topic name here. So it is under the namespace LIDARs, if it is a combination of both the LIDARs. And then 
it's called non-ground points and you can here you can just see the non-ground points we removed all the ground points so you can play around here to see the different stuff uh, let us also see what different topics now showed up in addition to what was there before uh, so i'm going into another terminal going into the ade environment again and here i'm just going to do a raw topic list so previously we only had like you know some of the sensor information now we have more so starting from here this is you know points filtered is basically um, the output from the filter transform node in the autoware auto it's basically filtering out the reflections from the ego vehicle itself so that we don't have we don't consider it obstacle and um, when and the points filtered we have from the front lidar and the rear lidar separately and then they get fused together by the point cloud fusion node and here that is the fused output and this goes into the ray ground filter which produces points ground and then non ground points and this goes into the Euclidean cluster, which produces the bounding boxes that you see here. Uh, you can also look at the different nodes that are running. Uh, so ROS2 node list, and you can see the different nodes. As I mentioned, there's a filter transform node, there's a fusion node, ray ground classifier, Euclidean cluster. So you can play around here, see what each node is doing. You can, for example, see ROS2 node info and look at what, let's say, filter transform node is doing um, so you can see uh, it's, it's subscribing to the raw sensor the raw sensor points and then it publishes the filtered points so that's that um, yeah so you can basically drive around here and see how the perception stack works as you can see there are some pain points with the perception stack you know buildings and trees those are all uh, always not detected correctly i mean they are usually under segmented or over segmented and all that so you can see that happening here so at this point um you know how the output looks so you can like start jumping into the code and you know making few changes and see how it looks in the visualizer so the visualizer is pretty helpful in terms of making you understand how, what each topic is doing so yeah that's all i had for the lab session uh, i hope this was informative and you guys can do the same thing that i did open up the visualizer change the topic name see what each node is doing and all that so uh, thanks for listening um, hope to see you guys in the future lecture as i mentioned the, there will be an in-depth lecture about the simulators so yeah that will give you more insight on how the simulator actually works but this was just an overview of how to run the perception stack with the simulator thank you